Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Spotlight on Home Security Cameras. My name is Susan McBride, and my co-presenter is Mike Edding, and we are with the Hinsdale Public Library Adult Services Department. Our goal for tonight's presentation is to provide you with the information that you will need if you are considering installing home security cameras. We are planning to cover everything from specific features of the cameras, how the data from the cameras is stored, installation considerations, what you need to know about cloud-based systems, as well as IP systems, and even the new Apple HomeKit secure video. Next slide. So why security cameras and why now? Security cameras have been gaining popularity in recent years for a variety of reasons. There's more concern over crime, there's the ability to share footage with local law enforcement, and an explosion of easy to install, pretty self-explanatory um, home security systems that include cameras. Um, and they have been the biggest driving force behind the growth in um, this interest. In fact, recently, the city of Chicago even announced an incentive program for residents to purchase home security cameras in an effort to help curb crime in the city. But not all security cameras are created equal, and there are important things to consider before you buy and install these cameras. Um, and these range from your own personal privacy and security being pretty much at the top of the list. So the first question is, do cameras actually deter crime? Because that's why many people are, are installing them. And um, there really hasn't been a vast amount of research on the effectiveness of cameras in deterring crime. Um, but in general, studies have shown that home security cameras do seem to deter crime. Um, a study conducted by the UNC Department of Criminal Justice and Criminology found that most burglars do consider outdoor cameras and other surveillance signs and equipment when they choose which house they're going to burgle. So um, there is some evidence that shows that cameras are a, a deterrent. And, and do they actually help law enforcement? Police forces across the United States made more than 20,000 requests just last year for footage captured on rings, video doorbells, and other home security cameras. So this underscores the rapid growth of these um, security cameras and the use of them by law enforcement. Some officers have celebrated digital informants for helping them gather valuable evidence and watch over the public at large. But the proliferation of, um, and of the kind of surveillance cameras that were once in airports, banks, convenience stores, but are now all over our neighborhoods has also raised some privacy questions because it's meant that millions of unsuspecting people are being recorded without their knowledge or their consent. Another thing to consider is what's being done with some of the video that footage that is being captured in the cloud. So just last week, um, the news reported that Amazon handed ring video doorbell footage to police without owner's permission at least 11 times so far this year. Um, a figure that highlights the unfettered access that the company is giving to police to, to everybody's ring cameras. Um, Amazon is making the decision whether or not um, the, yeah, um, who has access to their footage and whether or not it is um, a, a, an issue of security that needs to be addressed. Um, in addition, there are some other concerns over cameras coming from the law enforcement officials themselves. So in South Florida, um, a gunman um, who authorities say killed two FBI agents at an apartment complex recently saw them approaching through his home camera and he knew there was they were there. So that's how he was able to open fire and kill them. Um, so my purpose in raising these points is just to demonstrate 
that whether to install security cameras and where to install security cameras is a very important consideration. So there are a few different ways to approach the different types of security cameras, and we're gonna be talking about this. You're probably gonna to wanna to start by considering where you're planning to put your camera. Are you gonna have it outdoors? Are you gonna have it indoors? Or are you gonna have a combination of both? Other considerations would be, how are they gonna receive power? Are they wired into you know, a plug or are they battery operated? Um, will they require Wi-Fi or cellular signals? Um, will video footage be stored on the camera itself or on your computer or in the cloud? And finally, will the camera design work for your purposes and what you're wanting to do? Tonight's presentation is primarily focused on outdoor cameras, but there is a use for indoor cameras as well, particularly in places like vacation homes where you're not there all the time and you just want to keep an eye to make sure um, that um, you're notified if there's a break in or if there's some activity when you're not there. Um, much of the technology we discuss for outdoor cameras does carry over for the indoor ones as well. Um, in addition, there are the video doorbells like the ring doorbells that I talked about earlier. And this is just another type of outdoor camera that is specifically at your door, um, you know, where you would have your doorbell. And they can be very handy and easy to install. Um, but again, with the video doorbells, you're going to want to pay attention to the manufacturer's privacy agreements. So let's move on to the next slide. So let's start by discussing some of the features that make these security cameras so useful. So today's security cameras are equipped with motion sensors and the motion sensors are used to trigger the camera to begin recording and to send you alerts about a captured event, whatever it was, whatever motion they picked up. And so that's why the having a good motion sensor in your camera is really important because otherwise you're going to, going to be receiving a lot of alerts that um, there's been an incident or an event, um, but perhaps that event is just your neighbor walking the dog or um, wind blowing a tree or, um, you know, it could be any number of things. It's not an actual event that, that you would be concerned about. Um, so thanks to these built-in sensors that monitor the camera's field of, of view for movement, you can go about your daily business confident that you're going to be automatically alerted to any suspicious activity in your home. If you didn't have motion sensors in your camera, you would have to just keep your eyes glued to your camera feed on your phone or your computer, because otherwise you wouldn't know when a, an event occurred. Um, so that's why they're so important. There are basically two technologies when it comes to motion sensors. Um, one is called passive infrared, and that is um, it, it detects motion by um, the ambient heat that is emitted by living things. So it's only going to pick up um, objects or um, things that emit heat. Um, this is the type of sensor that the ring doorbell uses. Um, um, the second type is called computer vision. This is a little um, different type of technology. Um, it is the mo type of motion sensor that is used in most home security cameras. Um, this is a broader approach where the camera software analyzes sequential frames of live video, and it looks for differences and registers a motion event when a big enough change is detected. Um, the idea behind computer vision is to detect motion and if possible, to determine the shape of the object that moved. So it can, um, uh, using algorithms, figure out if it was a person, if it was a car, if it was um, an animal, if it was a package delivered by um, a, you know, Amazon or, or whatever. Um, and so it, it can be a very useful technology. Um, Nest cameras use computer vision for their um, motion sensors, if you've heard of them. So a couple of the pros and cons. Um, one of the benefits of using the infrared PIR sensors is that um, they tend to be more reliable to filter out inconsequential activities such as 
curtains fluttering in the breeze um, or light streaming through a window. It's also very power efficient. So if you're using a battery operated camera, then having that infrared technology um, will help extend the life of your batteries. Um, the main advantages of the computer um, vision motion detection is that it does allow for a greater analysis of what the camera's picking up. And so it can identify the object that is creating motion a lot better using these um, advanced features like person detection, or even in some cases, um, facial recognition technology. Um, so it's, it's a pretty cool um, technology to um, have built into your motion sensors. Um, the one thing I will say though, is that with um, the computer vision, um, you, um, a lot of times you do have to have a subscription to um, the cameras um, ma manufacturing to get your um, alerts through them and, and, you, and you pay for the subscription in order to receive information about what the events are and um, the analysis of the event, whether it's a person or a car or, 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 or whatever. Um, so how do you get the most from using the motion detection of your camera? Well, the first thing you wanna do is make sure that you follow the instructions that the manufacturer has provided in terms of where to place the cameras. You also wanna take advantage of any opportunity that your camera gives you to help it learn whether it be um, changing the sensitivity of the infrared or um, letting it know when an event is not a consequential event um, and helping um, provide feedback, um, whether the motion is interesting or uninteresting, this will help um, the algorithm come up with a um, fine tune itself so that you get a better sense of um, you know, what the motion is that, that's causing your camera to turn on. You can also experiment with your camera motion sensitivity settings until you find the notification frequency that's more accurate and less annoying. And then finally, you will wanna take advantage of your camera's ability to identify activity zones. And what that is, the activity zone is the area um, that you have identified for your camera to pay attention to. So um, instead of having your whole front yard um, be picked up by your camera, you may wanna focus on just your front door or just your driveway or um, the, the side door or um, one narrow area. And, and a lot of the cameras will allow you to set these activity zones and that way, if it is just somebody walking the dog, it's not gonna pick up when it, the camera's activity zone is focused only on your front door, for example. Next slide. So um, internet requirements. Um, home security cameras will require the internet. Um, they send out alerts with videos using the internet and you receive these alerts um, using the internet. So you are gonna need a good upload speed where the cameras are located and a good download speed where you're gonna be, where your viewing device like your phone or your computer is located. And usually the bottleneck is the upload speed at the camera's location and the upload speed um, refers to how many megabytes of data per second that you can send information from your camera's location to your um, phone's location or your viewing location. Um, the download speed will refer to how fast you can receive the information at, at your phone. And so um, you wanna make sure that you've got sufficient um, speed that you your camera is able to actually send you the information because what's the point in having the camera if it's not able to get it to you. Um, for best results, you're probably going to need to have at least two um, megabytes per second up to four megabytes per second for both your upload and your download speed 
for each camera. So if you're going to have multiple cameras, that's going to um, add to the amount of internet speed that you're going to need. So three of the most commonly sold manufacturers of home security cameras are Ring, Next, and Arlo. And Ring recommends one to two megabytes per device for both upload and download speeds. For Nest cameras, um, depending on the camera and video quality, the required internet speed is anywhere from 0.5 to four megabytes of bandwidth. And then the Arlo camera recommends between 0.3 and 1.5 megabytes per second. Next camera or next slide, sorry. So you have a security camera, it's taking videos and what's it doing with those videos that it's taking? They need to be stored somewhere because um, if something were to happen, you need to be able to go back and review the footage to determine what happened and um, who the perpetrator might be, for example. So, um, so where do you store this data? Um, well, it can either be stored locally. And by that, um, that means a couple of things. It could be stored on the camera itself in a micro SD card or some other card, or it could be stored um, on your computer, or it could be stored in the cloud. Um, and there are pros and cons with both of these options. Knowing what they are can help you decide what might be right for you. So what is local storage? As the name suggests, local storage keeps your security camera footage on your camera. This means that you may not need internet or monthly fees for the subscriptions that I was talking about earlier um, for your camera to do its job. Uh, plus your recordings may be less susceptible to data breaches or to someone watching them without your permission. In reality, whether you use cloud or local storage, you will likely need the internet. Um, and we'll get into that a little later in the program. Most security cameras that store local video do it in one of three ways. Um, the removable storage, like I mentioned, like a micro SD card, and this allows you to swap memory cards between devices so you can take what was on your camera and watch it on your computer, for example. Um, another is external storage. Um, this is uh, a traditional method for storing footage from multiple cameras in one place. Um, you can use an NVR, which is short for network video recorder. And I don't know, Mike, are you going to be getting into that maybe a little later? Yes. Yeah. Um, and the cameras will use video cables or Wi-Fi to link to the NVR, and then it will process and store your videos for you on a hard drive. And Mike is going to get into that. And then the other option would be built in storage on the camera. The downside of this is that there's no way to increase it and it's usually pretty limited. So that's not really a great option. So that's local storage. Cloud storage is the other option and cloud storage will save your videos behind usernames and passwords and encryption on a secure remote server we hope. And if you do use cloud storage, you want to make sure that you use extremely safe passwords. So, you know, a string of gibberish um, and, you, and you want to use the two-factor authentication. Just you don't want anybody to be able to access your videos from the cloud. Um, Cloud-based storage is wholly dependent on the internet. So there's no way to record videos if your camera's offline. Um, but it is a great way for keeping your video safe. Um, if your camera gets stolen, for example, the video isn't being stored on the camera itself, so they won't have access to that. Cloud storage um, comes in two different flavors. It can There is event recording, and this is where the camera will um, send to the cloud short clips of events, which would be triggered by the motion sensors. Um, these clips usually aren't much longer than a few minutes. Um, that, and that's the most common type of cloud storage because it uses less in internet bandwidth. It helps with battery powered cameras to go longer without recharging. 
Um, so Arlo cameras, the Ring stick up cam and Wise cameras all use this event-based cloud storage, for example. The other type of cloud storage is continuous recording. This actually saves everything that the security camera sees. So it has your whole library of your security camera. And this is ideal for events that last longer than a few minutes, but it does require a wired power source and a lot of internet bandwidth. Finally, one final note is that cameras that use this continuous recording usually use event recordings to help you spot activities. So you are you don't have to sit through days and days and days of, of watching the video. It usually marks where there is an event so that it's easier to find what you're looking for. Next slide. So the cameras are a great way to deter, to deter things like vandalism and property damage. And they can even prevent crimes from taking place near your property, as I mentioned earlier. Um, but they can also increase the target on your house and even on the camera itself. If somebody sees a camera, it may say, hey, there's something here worth storing or stealing. Um, and they may want to disable the camera itself. So you do have to pay attention to um, where you place the camera and how the camera is constructed to try to dis um, prevent vandalism. So um, first, when choosing a camera, pay attention to how it is mounted on the exterior, exterior of your home and is the quality of its build durable enough to withstand bricks or rocks being thrown at it, for example. Some highly recommended cameras are mounted using magnets, which are not vandal resistant. Arlo is a great example. Arlo cameras, for example, are great cameras with really good motion sensors, but they are marketed by saying the Arlo 4 comes with a strong magnetic base so you can easily detach and reattach it. Since the batteries need charging at least every six months, that will definitely come in handy. Well, yes, it will come in handy if it's easy to remove, if you have to replace the batteries or recharge it. But if it's easy to remove, then it's also going to not deter um, would-be criminals from removing it and, and not getting themselves videotaped. So um, that is something to pay attention to. Um, if you want to prevent vandalism from um, on your camera, you want to place it as high as possible. The higher your security camera is mounted, the harder it becomes for vandals to damage it. Um, the thing you have to keep in mind is that the higher you mount the camera, the smaller the subjects will um, appear, which can make it difficult to distinguish them. So um, you just want to make sure that you've got, you choose a camera model that has the, the zoom and the resolution that will provide adequate identification of anyone who breaks into your property um, from the height that you want to place it. Another strategy could be to consider um, hiding the camera, finding a hiding place. If vandals or um, criminals can't find your security camera, then they can't vandalize them. So you can tuck your cameras into nooks and crannies or hide them kind of under the shadow of gutters. You just wanna make and uh, take into account the fact that if it's hiding behind something that the camera view is not being obstructed by whatever it is that it's hiding behind. Um, you also want to make sure that you monitor your security feed. A security system isn't any good if it's never monitored. And vandals and thieves have a knack for figuring out whether um, you're routinely checking your security footage um, on your camera. And if um, and they know that there's a good chance that they'll get caught or arrested. Um, They'll, they're, they're far less likely to come to your property. So just keep an eye on the feed and don't ignore those alerts as they pop up. Um, and then the other thing you can do um, is to install vandal proof security cameras. And Mike's gonna talk a little bit more about some of the more durable security cameras at the end of the program. Um, but you do wanna make sure that you routinely check your cameras. You wanna make sure that they're working, that they're um, in good shape 
and um, make sure that you're dealing with any damaged equipment so that you can have the peace of mind from your security cameras. Next slide. So um, this is just a quick table um, to discuss camera build. And in addition to um, preventing um, thieves or vandals from damaging or stealing your camera. Another important uh, consideration for outdoor cameras is how well they're going to withstand the outdoor conditions. It's important to take into account the camera's temperature range as well as the IP rating. And so in our climate, we see temperatures, you know, from zero degrees or even colder to, up, you know, 100 degrees um, Fahrenheit. So you want to make sure that your camera is rated to work within that temperature range if it's going to be outside your house. Um, a camera's IP ratings will tell you how resistant it is to both solids and liquids. So, for example, um, it uses a two digit number. Um, and the first digit will refer to um, how um, it resists solids and the second will um, cover liquids. So for example, if a, an outdoor camera has an IP rating of 65, which is common for many outdoor cameras, then it would be completely dust tight and able to withstand low pressure water jets, which is sufficient for rain and snowstorms. Most security cameras will claim that their outdoor cameras are either weatherproof or weather resistant or waterproof, but these terms really don't mean anything. You really want to look at the IP ratings just to make sure that they are going to be um, protected from the elements when they're out, out, out of, outside your house. Next slide. So finally, you want to consider where you're going to place your cameras. Um, and um, this can help you figure out which cameras are best for you. So um, outside your house, which is primarily what we're um, looking at, there are a few key positions where you want to have your camera focused. Um, the most obvious is at the front door. Um, you might assume that intruders are always sneaking into the side or back entrances, but statistically, 34% of burglars use the front door. Um, and it's also where package thieves are going to strike. So making sure that you get that front door covered with your camera is really the first and most important place to, to angle your camera. Following that would be your back door and your side doors, because um, doors that are out of sight um, will allow visitors to enter undetected. Uh, about 22% of break-ins happen through the back door, for example. So that would be the next place that you would want to have a camera. And if you um, have a, the ability to have a third camera, then perhaps focusing on the garage and driveway. Um, garages are very common targets of burglars because they're one of the weakest entry points to the home a lot of times. A uh, camera pointed at your garage or driveway will um, keep an eye on bikes, tools, grills, sports equipment, um, cars. Um, so, it, it, you know, it, it, there's a lot of things in your garage that can get stolen. If your garage is detached, the camera will help you stay connected to what's going on at the garage. If the car is attached, then it's going to protect you from um, an entryway into your home. <coughs> Excuse me. And then finally, you could put a camera um, in um, at outside your house focused on your yard, um, just to keep an, an eye on some of the activity that's going on in your yard. Um, if you're going to have cameras on the interior of your house, you're going to want to make sure that you're prioritizing rooms that have large ground floor windows and that are common spaces. Um, so family rooms or kitchens, maybe hallways, you don't wanna put them in private spaces at all, ever. So not in the bedrooms, not in the bathrooms, things like that. Cameras are great for your safety, but you have to be mindful of privacy issues and the privacy of others in your neighborhood. So you wanna check in and make sure what the laws are for the area where you live, um, but you, in general, um, you can have security cameras focused on your yard. You can have securities cameras focused on your neighbors, the outside of your neighbor's fence, 
but you don't want to have security cameras that can see into their home. That's um, not um, that's footage that would be used for non-security purposes, and so that is not um, a, a legal or a good practice. Um, and also keep in mind that um, these rules apply to video surveillance only. Audio recordings without knowledge and consent is illegal, completely illegal in most circumstances. So you don't wanna have audio recordings. And so that's a little bit about um, where you wanna place your cameras. Mike? Thanks, Susan. Uh, so I'd like to introduce you to a concept uh, called Dory. And Dory, basically uh, refers to detect, observe, recognize, and identify. And you can see on the diagram here that there are some color-coded boxes. The furthest away from the security camera is detect. That's, that's where um, the camera can gather information, but there aren't enough pixels to de determine pretty much anything, then that is a person. As the person gets closer, they become part of the observe range. And the, in this range, you can kind of see what the person is doing, whether they're walking across um, ac across the screen, whether they're, um, they're maybe going from door to door, and it looks like they're checking handles on doors to see whether they're, they're open, that would be in the observe range. Recognize is closer still. And this is, if you know who a person is, you, you can identify them maybe by the way that they walk or their favorite coat that they wear all the time. That would be in the recognize zone. And identify is the very closest. Um, and identify, you could actually use the footage that you capture to sort of beyond a reasonable doubt, determine who the person actually is. Those are the different zones and cameras based on their, their lens narrowness or wideness and their megapixels, both of those things affect how far out these different zones can go. So in a perfect world, you would want to be able to identify someone as far out as possible. Like if they were uh, 50 feet away, it would be great if you could identify them without or beyond a reasonable doubt, but that's, that's not really how it works in the real world. We're working with a limited number of pixels in the image and it can't really support that at, unless you have a, a very narrow image of the person. So security professionals use DORI, that's the, the acronym DORI, uh, to determine what types of cameras and lenses are appropriate for your situation. In general, you, you would like to be able to recognize and identify people at a distance because this can help you solve crimes rather than simply show you that a crime occurred by some unknown person. Um, one important thing in this whole calculus is, is the lens choice. And specifically, should you be using wide angle lenses or more narrow angle lenses? I mentioned this because cameras in their marketing information often push the benefits of wide angle lenses, intimating that you can cover your whole front yard with a single camera because of the incredible field of view it has. What they don't tell you is that when you do select a, oops, a, uh, a camera that's very wide, you have to be very close to, the, to a wide angle lens camera to get that identification and recognition. Uh, so that, that sort of, it's great maybe as an overview camera if you have a wide angle camera, but if you want to really spot someone who has committed an act and figure out who they are, something narrower will serve you better. Um, in the light blue chart on this slide, underneath the colored dory, you can see the distance from the camera in meters 
for a two point, um, I think it's 2.8 millimeter versus a 3.6 millimeter camera. And the recognized figures jump from 11 meters to 14 meters away when you move from that wide angle 2.8 lens to a somewhat narrower 3.6 millimeter. And cameras come in, in many, many different sizes. You could get a six millimeter or a 12 millimeter camera. So you can imagine how that would increase the distance from the camera for identify and recognize. In addition to using narrower angle cameras, cameras with higher megapixels will also perform better at these recognize and identify tasks. Um, you can see people at longer distances, though we'll talk in a little bit about why megapixels aren't the whole story when it comes to, to things like low light, especially. So we've been talking about this kind of in a theoretical way. Let's get a little more concrete. I'm gonna switch slides here. There's this lens calculator that has been put out by a company called the Internet Protocol Video Market, where you can actually plug in certain cameras into their little calculator. You can see um, on the, the lower left-hand corner, this is a screenshot from their website. So I put in the, the Hinsdale Public Library's address, 20 East Maple, and you can see uh, an overhead shot of the library. And then it looks like they have a camera looking away from the entrance of the library towards the village hall. And the camera that I have in this screenshot on the left-hand side of the screen is a ring floodlight camera, which has this super wide, uh, I think it's almost like a 180 degree view. So you can capture a lot of information there. But if you look below that image with the cars of the driveway, you can see at 50 feet, what kind of resolution you would get when looking at a person. And you can see, you can barely tell it's a person even in that image. So as a way of contrast, I've plugged in some other cameras, a series of three, four megapixel cameras. And each of these cameras has the same sensor, but they, they have different focal lengths, a 2.8 millimeter lens on the left, a 3.6 in, in the middle, and a six millimeter on the right. And you can see in the image here that as you get narrower in terms of the field of view of your camera, um, you can see much more detail in the person's face. So this is just something to keep in the back of your mind. You could try this calculator out. It has a lot of cameras, but it doesn't have all cameras that you might come across. And some of the cameras may be slightly out of date. So use it as a general tool, but I really like how this can show you the impact of choices you make specifically in terms of focal length. Moving on to a slide I entitled Chasing Megapixels. So there's a phenomenon colloquially known as megapixel chasing, where people buy securities for the first time and they think that the most important thing or the most important, important feature of a camera is the number of megapixels it has. I certainly have been guilty of this early on in my um, investigations of security cameras. And I think this is because we've been conditioned to believe that higher resolution images are always better whether they're in 4K TVs, in our phone screens, in digital cameras, um, or even in computer monitors. But in reality, the situation is often a little more complicated than strictly megapixels. And this is especially true in security cameras. One factor which I think is at least as important as megapixels is the sensor size of your camera. This is the rectangle of photosensitive receptors in your, inside your security camera behind the lens, which captures the light and the colors in an image. The general rule is that for a given megapixel count, the larger the sensor, the better the image quality. So if you have a larger sensor on a four megapixel camera, it will be less noisy and less grainy than an image 
than a smaller sensor on a four megapixel camera, which packs those four megapixels in quite densely. Because they're so packed densely into that smaller sensor, they're not as able or as easily able to capture light in dark situations. And I'll talk more about low light performance in a moment. For this reason though, you may find that some two megapixel cameras provide a better night image than some four megapixel cameras because the pixel density is not super high like it is on those four megapixel cameras. But really the trick is finding the appropriate sensor size for a given megapixel count. For example, on a, a two megapixel camera, you want a sensor that's one divided by 2.8 inches or larger. For four megapixels, one divided by 1.8 inches or inches or larger. And for eight megapixels, you need a pretty large sensor for it to work well. It should be one divided by 1.2 inches or larger. The problem is this information on sensor size is difficult for us as consumers to find. Your best bet is to look for a detailed review of the camera in question to see if the review the reviewer mentions the sensor size. Another technique that I use is to Google technical specifications along with the make and model of the camera. And sometimes that'll pull up a spec sheet where you can see sensor size and it'll list it. Um, use those two different techniques to try to get to the real story when it comes to the sensor. Installation considerations. Susan's talked a little bit about this uh, in terms of how many cameras and where to put them on your home. Um, from what I understand, if your goal is to recognize and identify people, you wanna avoid mounting your cameras too high off of the ground. This, um, if you do this and you put them up high, you're going to capture pretty much the subject's head rather than their face, which is more identifiable. Um, so really experts say between six feet and eight feet tall on your home is a good height to place them to give you good visual recognition and identification. Of course, as Susan mentioned, the higher the security cameras are on your home, the more vandal resistant they will be. So it's kind of a balancing act that you have to play. But if you can get them somewhere in that eight foot range, that's pretty good. The next decision you'll be making is how many cameras to buy and where to place them. And Susan talked a lot about um, where to position cameras on your home. And I think that's good advice. The only thing that I would add to that really is that you want to have overlapping coverage. So you might have a camera on one side of your home pointing kind of towards the other camera that's on the other side of your home. And then the, the footage overlaps in the middle and that way, if someone comes by and tries to vandalize one of your cameras or disable it, you can see them come into the screen and do that. It's good to have that overlapping coverage. Um, it's also a good idea to cover ground level doors and windows like Susan was mentioning. Um, the, your front door is a big one, your garage is a big one, um, but also the ones hidden from the street. If it's dark outside, it, it might be difficult to see someone on the side of your home, but if you have a good security camera, you can capture those images. So we've talked a little bit about nighttime. So how do you, how well do these cameras do when you put them in a dark condition? Really, cameras um, have a tough time with night. It's it's difficult to cope with low light and many consumer cameras are saddled with small sensors relative to their megapixels. Uh, this can yield a blurry or a noisy image at night or even both. And the, the blur happens when the camera's shutter speed is, is not high enough to capture the image. And even though it's a video image, it still has a shutter speed that it uses to try to stop the motion. Um, if you have too high of a shutter speed, like your camera is trying to adjust for the lack of light by 
lengthening the shutter speed, it's gonna yield a, a blurry mess when you try to pause your video. In addition, the, the noise level of these pictures can be so high in night images that you can't readily make out details in their face because it's so grainy or so noisy. Cam cameras uh, tend to handle night in a couple different ways. They might try to maintain a color image at night, or they might switch to a black and, uh, black and white mode at nighttime, which is better able to provide a crisp image than a color image. A camera which switches to black and white mode will in general have a less noisy image than one which stays in colors, but switching to black and white is not, um, is not without a price. Namely, you eliminate what might be important information, like the color of a car in a frame that, that the perpetrator uses to escape. That wouldn't be visible um, in a black and white image. So camera makers know that these low light levels can cause big problems, so they compensate with extra built-in illumination. This could be a couple different things. It could be a bright white floodlight that uh, gives more light when the camera um, is at night. And to your eyes, the, the scene looks nice and bright as well. So it's not like it's um, infrared light, which is invisible to the naked eye, it's, it's bright white. Um, so I, <laughs> the infrared illuminators that I have alluded to just now are often, if, if your security camera has a ring of small circ circular dots around the lens, those are probably infrared illuminators and they send out this constant stream at nighttime of infrared illumination. So even though your eye can't pick it up, it's, it's bright white um, as far as your camera can tell. And each of those techniques, whether it's natural light that's bright or infrared that's bright can work pretty well. You might want to actually supplement the lights on your camera with your own extra illumination in order to keep it out of that noisy and blurry mode. And you can buy infrared illuminators for your black and white night cameras like the one I have pictured here. This is by a company called Tendelux. And this particular model is about $25. And I found that it works quite well. It's hard to tell from the image, but this is a small thing. The, the lens on it is just about two and a half inches wide. So very unobtrusive. You can mount a couple of these pointed towards your backyard or your front yard, and you'll have great illumination for the black and white mode cameras. Of course, you could also help your color security cameras with your own bright white floodlights that you have installed. Those could be continuous flood floodlights that work all night long, or they could be motion activated floodlights. So either of those could be effective. So this extra illumination that we're adding can really solve a lot of those problems with nighttime images, but it may make more sense to get a camera that inherently performs better in the nighttime. Uh, and this is when we're talking about things like uh, the sensor size of the, the camera. And if, it, if the camera is better able in general to capture that low light. So um, I found that the best way to sort of tell whether a given camera is going to do what you need it to do at nighttime is to actually seek out video reviews of these cameras on YouTube. So search for uh, review and the name of your camera and look for ones where they're actually looking at moving images in the nighttime. This is like the ultimate stress test for a camera. In fact, most security cameras, even the cheaper ones that you can find um, at Best Buy for not much, $50 a piece or something, those are gonna do pretty well in the daytime. The problem is at nighttime, what do they do? So if you get footage where you can see your individual camera at nighttime, you'll be better able to tell whether it can handle those moving images, which lead to blurs in many cases, or 
whether the image is going to be very grainy. Um, both of those are, are important. So in the next section, Susan is gonna talk about taking all this information and choosing a cloud-based camera system and how you might go about making that choice. Sure. So think of cloud-based camera systems um, as an entry-level camera. If you're thinking about trying out security cameras, this might be the right route for you. Um, in general, they are less expensive. Um, they are pretty easy to install. They have really slick interfaces with um, your phone or your computer um, a lot of times. Um, and um, th in general, they're, they're pretty decent cameras um, to, to capture you know, most of what you wanna capture. What makes them cloud-based is that, um, as I mentioned earlier, the video footage is being recorded to the cloud. So um, it's being handled by the manufacturer or some other third party. Um, and most cameras then will um, have their own subscription service um, that where you access the cloud storage. So you pay monthly or annually to store your videos in the cloud. The advantage of cloud storage is that you can view your footage anywhere with an internet connection. And if your camera gets destroyed, you still have access to its recordings. Um, so usually what happens is the streaming video cameras will connect to your home Wi-Fi network and they'll send out alerts and video clips and live video feeds to your smartphone, allowing you to monitor activity while you're away. It's, it's pretty easy to do. Wireless security cameras connect to Wi-Fi, but they can be plugged in for power or they can be battery, battery operated. So wireless means it's Wi-Fi, not the power source is wireless. Um, you know, you may wanna opt for a, a camera that does actually plug in for your power because um, the batteries can last um, a few weeks, a few months, you know, maybe up to six months, but they will have to be recharged or replaced. And then you're gonna to have to access the camera and reinstall it and everything. And it, and it can be a pain. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Um, so the cloud-based cameras will require you to play these monthly fees for some of the most important features, um, the storage, the monitoring zones, the um, ability to focus on certain areas or ignore certain areas in your camera's field of view. Um, storage subscriptions have actually become a pretty healthy source of this recurring revenue for the manufacturers. They really like it, um, but they do add benefit. Um, and they're adding new artificial intelligence and object recognition to their subscriptions all the time allowing you to identify people, animals, vehicles, packages, and even faces um, to cut down on some of the nuance alerts and the recordings from animals or trees that you don't want, really care that much about. So a few companies like Ring and Wise are working on custom artificial intelligence features so that you can train your camera to pick up on certain changes. Um, such as whether the car a car is parked in your driveway. So that's a little basic information about cloud-based cameras. If you want to go this route, you're going to start by looking at what type of camera you want. So you could get, um, you know, a, a security camera, a video doorbell like the Ring or some of the others. Um, or one of the floodlight cameras, like Mike mentioned. So you, you kind of need to start by what is going to meet your needs um, and what type of camera would be best. Um, and then you're going to pick, um, look at um, what type of power source are you wanting? Do you want it to be hardwired into your house so that you don't have to change the batteries? Would you prefer a, um, an easier install and um, you don't mind um, charging those batteries every once in a while. 
um, but that's probably going to be your second choice. Um, and then you're going to want to look at the cloud storage plans that the camera um, manufacturers offer. Um, you want to know how much free cloud storage comes with the camera and then how much additional storage costs. Um, many of these cameras won't let you download clips to send to authorities unless you pay for a subscription. So that's something important to keep in mind. Um, and the amount of free online storage and um, paid subscription storage varies drastically among manufacturers and, and the even within the manufacturers, the different models of cameras. So make sure you do your homework and you look into what those um, subscription plans cost. And then the, another thing you're gonna wanna consider is your privacy. Um, these cameras do provide some peace of mind, but it's um, a re worth remembering that they also provide a view into your home and they connect to the internet. So if you can watch your home from your phone, you know, through the internet, um, other people can too. Um, the manufacturer may also have access to the video. Um, and so you wanna make sure that you're using unique usernames, difficult to guess passwords, um, and, and the two-factor authentication as an extra layer of security, um, as I mentioned earlier. So in terms of um, specific cameras, um, the Arlo Pro 4 Spotlight camera is one of the most highly rated cameras right now. Um, it's a cordless camera and it does require a subscription to the, their um, cloud-based storage, which is known as Arlo Secure. And this um, records clips and that helps you distinguish between the people, pets, packages, vehicles. So it uses AI to um, help you figure out what the event is. It captures good video quality and clear images, both in the day and at night, and it can record up to five minutes of continuous motion. Um, but that will drain the battery and it is a battery um, operated camera. So. Um, something to keep in mind is the longer the continuous um, videos, the more battery use. Um, and then another highly out, um, rated outdoor security camera that is part of the cloud-based cameras is the Nest Cam IQ Outdoors. And it also records continuously 24 hours a day, but it, will, um, it connects through a wire um, in your home. So it doesn't have any batteries, which makes it a little more um, practical. Um, and it's a little bit more expensive. It's around 300 to $350. The Arlo Pro usually runs about $200 or a little less. Um, um, installation is a little more difficult because it is wired and not battery powered, but it's also not as easy to remove. So um, different things to consider. So that's a little bit of the basics of the cloud-based um, camera systems. Mike's gonna give us some more information about other options. Thanks, Susan. I'm gonna briefly talk about Apple HomeKit Secure Video. I think it's kind of a unique thing that Apple is offering and it has some nice features for a relatively small monthly fee. The catch here is that it only really makes sense in Apple-centric homes. If you have an Apple TV, if you have um, iPads, if you have an iPhone, um, that sort of thing, that's where it would make a lot of sense when you have that synergy. So the specific re requirements for Apple HomeKit Secure Video, which is a mouthful, uh, are you need a compatible video camera and these are not necessarily the ones that you're going to easily find off the shelf. You might have to order them online. Uh, but things like the Logitech Circle View, which I have a picture of here on the right-hand side of the screen, this is maybe the most well-regarded of all the HomeKit secure video cameras that are available. But, and that's $160, but you can get others that are cheaper, like the Acara G2H Pro is only $70. So besides the camera, you're also going to need something in your home to serve as an Apple Home Hub. And the Home Hub 
will sort of get the data from the video feeds, encrypt it, and send it up to Apple's servers. It'll do some analysis to see if there's um, a person or a pet or or a vehicle in the scene before it sends it up. So it does, it's some of the brains of the, the system is in this home hub. And it comes in a variety of Apple products, but perhaps most common would be the Apple TV 4K at $180 and an Apple HomePod mini would also serve very well. And that's only $99. And in addition to those two things, you're gonna need an iCloud plus plan. And the plus plan is uh, over and above the free iCloud storage that you get when you own an Apple device. If you pay a dollar a month, you can get a 50 gigabyte per month plan. And if you have this, you can get one camera's worth of support. It'll work with that one camera. If you want to upgrade to more than one camera to five cameras, you'd have to have a, a 200 gigabyte per month plan, which is only $3 a month. And the prices for competitors in this space are typically more like $10 a month uh, for, for some of the more advanced features. So this can be a real value if you have an Apple home. So there are some pros to this. Uh, basically, it's, it can do things like provide notifications like all the cloud systems that Susan was mentioning but it can even trigger other home kit devices in your home. Like if you have some smart lights, uh, like the Philips Hue system of lights work with home kit. So when you, you could have it so the camera that, um, that is focused on your front door, when it sees someone enter the building, it'll turn on the lights in the foyer. So, Things like that become possible when you use this Apple HomeKit secure video. Apple gives you 10 days of storage in the cloud for motion events. And you can pull down uh, clips from that as needed before the 10 days are up. So it's not like they're gone forever. It has end-to-end -end encryption of your video. And this means that any files stored on Apple's servers are not available for viewing by Apple employees or by anybody who hacks Apple's servers. They have to have the encryption key, which is locally stored um, on your devices. So, and I mentioned that the cost per month is relatively cheap compared to other systems. So those are great features, but there are some downsides to the Apple uh, approach here. As I mentioned, you have to have a fair amount of Apple equipment for it to work. And, 10 day retention nowadays is seems pretty low. I think 30 days is more common. Um, and you can even get more than that with some of the competitors to Apple. You're gonna pay more for that storage retention, but at least it's available on Apple, it's, it's just not. So the system is pretty typical of Apple. It has a nice slick interface, it's easy to use, but it doesn't have a lot of customizability in the settings area. The limitation of five cameras that I mentioned might come into play if you're trying to put these on the exterior of your home and, and get those key entry points into, um, get video on those key entry points like windows and doors. Five cameras really isn't a lot. Um, you might need eight or even more to fully cover the outside of your home, not to mention the inside if you have any of those. And like all the other, or most of the other cloud-based systems that uses Wi-Fi to connect, which has limitations, it doesn't record motion events unless the internet is up and working. Still, if you have a lot of Apple stuff, I'd say this is maybe a good starter home security camera system. You can uh, get it without, without huge ongoing monthly fees and you may already have an Apple TV in your home all, um, that you could use as a home hub. So it might not cost that much to get started into it. So that's Apple HomeKit video. I'm gonna talk about the next main alternative to cloud systems, which are IP cameras next. IP cameras stand for internet protocol. And these cameras connect to your computer network 
where they record footage to either a network video camera or excuse me, a network video recorder, like Susan was mentioning in NVR, or they record it to a computer that's, that's living on your computer system at home. They save the files locally in your home, typically on hard drives. And as a result of this, your video is more secure. Generally speaking, the only people who have access to the footage are those with whom you share it. Because of the, uh, the different storage approach here, since it's locally stored on hard drives, you can achieve weeks or even months of video retention if you have a large enough hard drive or a series of hard drives. So that's a, a big advantage over cloud systems where the data lives in the cloud and has to be paid for by these cloud providers. Therefore, they don't want to hold on to it for a long time. So when you have this, um, this storage space in large capacities like we're talking about, you have the advantage of being able to do continuous recording like Susan was talking about, continuous recording to a hard drive somewhere on your network. But I think the most important uh, benefit that you get when you have these IP camera systems is that you have access to better cameras. They're likely to have larger sensors than consumer-based cloud systems they are highly adjustable and let you really dial in the image quality that you're looking for. You can shed, uh, set a shorter shutter speed to capture the image, um, to capture motion image more crisply. And they offer advanced features like, like wide dynamic range that sort of allows you to, to see into shadows a little bit better than a standard non-enhanced image. So as I mentioned before, you can use an IP camera system that records to a NVR. I have uh, an NVR system shown here on the page, or you can get one which records to a computer. NVR systems like this one here are simple black boxes that could either connect to your television or maybe a computer monitor somewhere in your home. They tend to be more compact somewhat easier to set up than computer-based systems and cheaper for that matter. Computer-based systems in contrast are much more customizable and have more features that can also be more expensive and complex to set up. One of the most popular software packages is called, is, win, is a Windows program called Blue Iris. And Blue Iris costs $70 and it will support a large number of cameras for that $70. It's extremely powerful, but requires quite a bit of technical knowledge to set up, I'd say. I use Blue Iris, and I still find myself stumped on how to do certain things. And I have to like look at online communities to see what people recommend you do in certain situations. Very powerful, but a little tough to, to sort of wrap your head around. A little bit more about IP camera systems. They come in various form factors and I've shown three of them here on the page. The long and narrow bullet style and the kind of uh, center left illustration here is, uh, is great for adjusting just so, but it may attract insects or maybe spider webs under that overhang in front of the lens. So those have their downsides. Dome cameras like the one at right here are great for indoor. They offer a sleek and unobtrusive appearance. I wouldn't use them outside necessarily because the protective clear coating or covering can lead to unwanted flare and reflections in your image. This doesn't seem to be a problem when they're placed inside. I'd say the best option for an outdoor camera is a turret style camera, which is at, at the bottom of the screen here. This uh, particular camera has the squat shape of a dome, which means it's a little more vandal resistant than maybe a bullet camera style, but it doesn't have the problems with reflections and flare that the dome camera does. 
one of the other main choices you'll be making in an IP camera system is whether to connect your IP camera via Wi-Fi or to get a camera that connects with a wire. And typically those are known as PoE or power over ethernet systems. The, it simply refers to the fact that the power and the signal are going over the same wire to your camera. And that's, I'd say the most common form of uh, IP camera is one that's wired with this PoE system. Wi-Fi cameras have the advantage of easier installation by far. Um, they are subject to the signal interference with the Wi-Fi in your home. You need to make sure you have good coverage for all the different camera locations. If, they're, if the Wi-Fi is extending through the side of your home to the camera, is it gonna be able to do that without problems? Or maybe do you have to install a mesh Wi-Fi network so that it works better or add access points throughout your home? Wired cameras are generally considered to be more reliable, but they do cost more to install. Like if you have them professionally installed, it might be twice as much per camera than a standard Wi-Fi model. We've talked about lens choice. Uh, we've talked about how wider angle lenses come with certain, certain drawbacks and narrower angle lenses might be a better choice, but there's a third option called varifocal lenses. And these are essentially zoom lenses. They're not zoom in the sense that you'll be zooming in and out all the time in your camera feed, but they're zoom in the sense that you can dial in specifically the angle of view that you want to see. You can focus in on that driveway rather than seeing the whole front yard. It allows you to increase those dory distances and identify and recognize from further out. And really, if you're not sure what focal length you need for your installation, a varifocal lens may be your best bet. Um, I've seen some cloud-based systems have varifocal lenses, which can be great for installing those and getting them dialed in just so, but they're more likely to be found in IP camera systems. Susan mentioned some popular brands for cloud-based cameras, and I'll do the same for IP cameras. Hikvision, Dahua, and Amcrest are all IP camera brands that are frequently recommended online for basically providing a lot of bang for your buck. The potential issues with these cameras, though, is that they're, they all have ties to China in some way. Hikvision and Dahua are partially or wholly owned by the Chinese government, and Amcrest cameras are made in China, though their company is headquartered in Texas. So why is China an issue? There have been public concerns raised that Chinese cameras may not be secure. So much so, in fact, that Dahua and Hikvision have recently been banned from marketing and advertising their cameras for sale in the US due to national security reasons. Other countries are exploring a ban as well. These cameras are still relatively easy to find on the US market though. They're just branded uh, as private label brands. So they're still out there. If you want to avoid these Chinese type cameras, you'll need to be fairly careful because a lot of the sort of generic ones are made in China. If you do decide to get a camera from Dahua, Hikvision, or Amcrest, I would look for settings in your computer's router to see if you can block traffic from these cameras out to the internet so they can't phone home and send sensitive information out. You might um, say, well, what am I supposed to do if all of the low-priced cameras are made in China and I can't really trust them? Well, you might want to get an American-made camera. Uh, Axis and Navigilon are two brands to consider. They're made in the United States. They're very high-quality cameras but they typically cost three or four times as much as these Chinese cameras. You might also consider Bosch cameras. Uh, it's a German company, but some of their cameras are made here in, in the United States. So you would get that made in America um, benefit. 
they're priced similarly to Axis and Avigilon, and they also offer great performance. And finally, I want to spend a few moments talking about Reolink. Uh, Reolink, if you're not familiar with them, is a Chinese-made camera that has gotten a lot of attention for its low price, and these are well under $100. They're seen by many as good entry level alternatives to cloud systems. The problem with Reolink, in my experience, while they perform great during the daytime, offering a beautiful color image, they offer poor performance at night. At least the Reolink camera that I owned um, had extremely blurry video at night. So early on in my um, camera journey, I, I bought this Reolink RLC 810A. And once I noticed its blurriness problems at night, I put it in a box and bought other cameras and I haven't pulled it out since. Your mileage may vary, of course, um, and Reolink certainly might have improved their, their low light performance since the days of this camera, which is still on sale by the way. But I thought I'd, I'd share my personal experience with you. So looking at the totality of IP cameras, they're great at a lot of things, but they do have some downsides. Compared to cloud-based systems, IP camera systems are more complicated. If you're just looking to set something up, put it in place without a lot of tinkering after the, in fact, after the fact, IP cameras are probably not for you. Similarly, IP cameras are more expensive to install. This is especially true if you use the wired PoE cameras, which are the common type. And finally, while the NVR and computer-based systems are more powerful and more customizable, they're also more clunky and inelegant compared to the cloud-based uh, software interfaces, which are very refined and polished. I think these IP camera systems interfaces are improving but they have a long way to go really to match the streamline elegance of cloud-based apps. So when you take all of this information, in conclusion, there are some things that you need to consider. Does a security camera system make sense for you? Are you willing to live with the possible privacy implications of a security camera system? Um, do you think that there's, um, a sufficient reason for you to have one? And how big do you wanna go? Do you want to have just a camera or two or do you wanna go full bore with um, cameras on all sides of your home? These are all things that you have to think about. You, If you do put these security cameras in place, you'll need to determine what's the most important thing to you. Do you want the convenience and easy installation of a cloud-based system or do you want the security reliability and privacy that you get with an IP camera system. And there's a, a whole ton of decisions you'll be making along the way as you go down this route, whether to get wide, narrow, or verifocal camera lenses, how many cameras will you need, how high will you mount them off the ground, how many megapixels will they be, is the sensor size large enough to support those megapixels. How do they perform in the nighttime, which is very directly related to the sensor size issue? How's the build quality like Susan was talking about? Are they vandalism resistant? Um, will they repel water and that sort of thing? There's a lot to think about here. While we can't say definitively what's best for your family, you'll have to make those decisions yourself. We hope that Susan and I have uh, given you some things to think about and some factors to consider as you're looking at one camera model versus another camera model. Um, and then you can make your own informed choices as to, to what's best for you. At this point, Susan and I would like to open the floor for questions that you may have. You can use the, the Q&A button or the chat function if you're more comfortable with that. You'll see that on the, the little navigation bar for your Zoom. So Mike, we do have two questions. Um, the first is, um, can you comment on the use of light bulb security cameras? And I'm thinking that you mean floodlight security cameras. Um, and Mike, you touched on that earlier. I don't know if you want to handle that one. Well, I, 
I think the idea of, and I, I just want to make sure that we're talking about the right thing here. There, there are also smart devices that can screw into a light bulb socket to give them power. So it's possible that there may be cameras out there that work in the socket and can kind of give you a downward facing view. I don't have any particular knowledge of those, but as Susan was mentioning, floodlight cameras where the floodlight is integrated to the sides or maybe all around the camera can be a good way to get illumination on the scene and keep it in that sort of color mode rather than switching to black and white mode. Um, and the benefits of color are, you know, you can see what color ball cap the person was wearing as they're uh, walking past your home in the dark, that sort of thing. Um, so hopefully that answered some of what you were trying to get at, Connie. Um, and then Chip wants to know if um, we know of any cameras that fit into a small peephole in an old front door at eye level. I don't have any knowledge of that. Mike, do you? Uh, I know that they exist. Um, there was one brand in particular that you could kind of retrofit into the space of a peephole that's existing, but I can't remember the name or the brand of it. Uh, it wasn't some very obscure brand. It was one of the, the major players. I just can't remember which one it was, um, but they, they do exist, Chip. They're out there. If I if I can find a reference to it, I'll let you know offline here uh, in the next few days. But yeah, that's a lot of the doorbells kind of expect you to do a, a kind of a special installation on the outside of your home to, to get that doorbell camera to work. But I, I think there are some that you can use the existing opening. Any other questions? Any, uh, anybody have any particular um, history with security cameras and have found that certain ones work very well for you? We'd love to hear that as well. Well, if you think of anything um, after the fact, you can certainly email your questions to Susan or myself and we'd be happy to get back to you. Thank you very much for coming tonight. Um, it, the program went a little bit long. We had a lot of information to relay, so hopefully we didn't stop you from your next activity tonight. But thanks so much for coming, and uh, attendees, we will be sending out slides of, of the program so you don't have to dig for your notes and, and try to recreate it that way. <laughs>